Welcome to another episode of Capital Spotlight. I'm your host, Rob Beardsley. This is episode 21. Our guest today is Adam Deermount. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate you having me. Good deal. So let's start off with just a quick background on yourself and Ranch Harbor. Sure. So um, my background is is maybe a little bit uh, unconventional, and then that'll lead you into the, the Ranch Harbor thing. So I graduated college back in 2001 uh, from Tufts University and uh, just outside of Boston. And uh, when I was an undergrad, I worked as a as an intern for Credit Suisse First Boston over in uh, in London and had every intent of uh, of going back there when I graduated. But uh, the the tech uh, bubble bursting kind of uh, kind of screwed up those plans, and like I think most undergrads, I kind of or some undergrads, I guess, had kind of foolishly put all my eggs in one basket, and was stuck uh, looking for a job when not many groups were hiring in uh, in, in a field that I wanted to be in. Um, I have sailed competitively my entire life. And a couple summers before, it worked as a sailing coach out in uh, Newport Beach, California, Newport Harbor Yacht Club. And it just happened their program director was leaving. So I took a job with, uh, with them for two years and, uh, and decided to go hang out on the beach while the, the recession was going on. And it, it turned out to be a great job. Um, I was managing a staff of like 17 people. There were 100 kids in the program. There was a substantial budget. But the other side of it was it was a phenomenal networking opportunity for a kid right out of college that all of a sudden you have direct uh, access to a bunch of people in the finance world, a bunch of people in the commercial real estate world. And as we were coming out of the recession, new companies were getting formed and members would hire me um, in the excuse me, in the off season when things were a little quieter to go run Excel models because I knew how to do that from uh, my background in college and, and uh, kind of got my start in the real estate world that way. Um, that led eventually when I was done uh, being a sailing bum for a couple of years to, uh, to a job uh, working in banking and then um, working for a uh, commercial real estate pension advisor. Um, I, uh, I jumped ship and went over to Merrill Lynch Capital, which was the on book uh, structured finance kind of middle market real estate side of Merrill Lynch right in time for it to blow up. I went over there in 2006. So things were good for about a year and a half and then came to a screeching halt. And I was stuck trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And I looked at going to grad school. Um, at the same time, a, a mentor of mine, a guy named Tim Hogan from back in my sailing days, was a, a CEO at a local or regional home builder and uh, was nearing retirement and got hired on to be a, a co-chief restructuring officer on the land source bankruptcy, which was a, a huge bankruptcy, um, involved uh, Newhall uh, Land and Farming up in, in Santa Clarita and a bunch of other uh, land banking assets that Lennar and LNR had got into. CalPERS recapped them basically at the top, lost a billion dollars on it, and it was just a mess. And Tim's pitch to me was, okay, I need somebody that knows how to run models that can help sell some of the non-core assets. Um, you know, you can go into, go do grad school, go get your MBA and do this theoretically, or come with me and, and see it in real time. And this was back in, uh, in 2008, 2009. So I went and did that. Um, once that entity exited bankruptcy, uh, I got hired on with uh, part of that consulting team uh, to go work for State Street Bank. They had uh, had ended up with the loan on El Toro Heritage Fields uh, down here in Irvine um, as a result of uh, lending in the overnight market to Lehman Brothers. And when Lehman Tank, they had a claim on that loan, um, but didn't custodial institution didn't really have any real estate experience. So they hired us on to help them restructure a, a very large uh, land development loan. Um, once we were done with that, uh, those larger consulting projects were starting to dry up and myself and, and Steve Sims, one of my current partners here at Branch Harbor, um, went in-house with a, a land brokerage company in California and started the group that would become uh, Landmark Real Estate, which was one of the precursors to Ranch Harbor. And the focus there, we were a capital advisor, focused primarily on um, small to, to middle market land and home building um, opportunities, going out and finding debt and equity finance for them. Um, we did that uh, for several years, started in 2011. 
Uh, starting in 2014, we started to pivot more into multifamily and commercial. Um, we grew that book over that period of time. We did uh, close to a, a billion four in, in total capital range between equity and debt, about 275 million in equity and the remainder in debt. Um, and starting last year, and this is where we get to the Ranch Harbor part, um, there was a, a group called Isles Ranch Partners, and Ranch Harbor is really a, a roll-up of Isles Ranch Partners, which was a, uh, at its peak, it was about a 900 million in, uh, in AUM um, land and home building vehicle that was backed by a large PE firm, single check uh, uh, manager. And they really were doing that as a market directional play coming out of the downturn. And, and Tom Radre, who is a, a good friend of mine that uh, that we had done business with, but you know, we're friends before that, we started talking to them and we said, you know, we're finding this white space in the market that um, we're going out on debt assignments. It's fairly easy that, you know, the, the stack is fairly well covered, whether you're looking at smaller or larger deals. But from an equity standpoint, once we get into kind of the too big to syndicate, um, too small for the funds, there's a bit of a white space and it's it's less competitive and there's there are funds that focus on it and do a good job, but far less of them um, and a lot less capital than the excuse me, the focus on the bigger deals. And Tom at the same time was looking to get out of kind of the single sector game and, and start uh, start playing in different sectors other than land and home building, which is a, you know, a, uh, a challenging business and, and highly cyclical. And they did very well in that space, but we're looking to do something different. So Starting last summer, we talked about joining forces, Creative Branch Harbor. We formal, informally launched back in uh, February, March, which was just uh, in, impeccable timing one way or the other for better or worse, and uh, informally launched in, uh, in September. And what we do is we, we went out and we raised um, some private capital to go allow us to do direct investments to fill that white space. We combined the asset management side of Isles Ranch Partners and the, the institutional caliber back office that, that they have, um, which is still is managing um, uh, is still managing projects, working through some of the larger projects for their previous investor. Um, the capital advisory business um, for uh, uh, that uh, that landmark brought to the table, and then also we we have a group that works on special situations and receivership. That's great. A lot to unpack there. Yeah, so, sorry for uh, <laughs> being so verbose. No, that's fine. So let's start with kind of the the capital strategies that you mentioned. Uh, sure. You've got di direct. You've got JV, and you've got advisory. So let's cover those, and then let's move into actually the sector specific strategies. Absolutely. So from a from a capital uh, perspective, uh, go into the, the direct side of it first. Um, what what we're really looking for on the direct side of it is um, we call it from a, a sailing perspective, we call it opportunities that fall below the rum line. And in competitive sailing, the rum line is a direct line between two marks on a course. And what you'll often see happen in a sailboat race when the boats round the windward mark and they're going downwind is boats will go up above the rum line as a defense to defend their wind from getting blanketed from a boat that's above them. And what you'll see happening is a big pack of boats ends up far above the rum line, sailing extra distance, blanketing each other, sailing in a pack. At the same time, there are opportunities to sail below the rum line if you can find a clear lane of breeze, sail a more direct path, and sail less competition. From a capital standpoint, we really view the rum line as kind of that 10 to $15 million range, where if you go much above it, you're getting into a highly competitive zone. When you go below it, you're getting into a less competitive zone. And we like to kind of aim below the rum line, just a different way of saying kind of sub-institutional deals. Definitely makes sense. Go ahead. Um, from, so we're, we're highly specific on our um, geographies for that. You know, we, we tend to stay in the Western US um, really, Colorado West will look Texas uh, at Texas as well, because with some of the Isles assets, they, they do have boots on. We do on the other side of the company have boots on the ground there. Um, we, you know, won't do um, uh, construction. Uh, we're usually looking more at a, you know, value add. Um, from an advisory standpoint, we really try and delineate away from 
uh, what we're doing on the direct investing side. So advisory is usually things that fall out of our investing box because we don't want to run into a conflict of interest issue with, um, you know, with a, a deal that, hey, we show it, we, we're doing it, or we show it to a, um, uh, to a potential investor and they look at it and they say, wait, isn't this what you guys do? Are you guys cherry picking deals? Usually when we take on advisory, it's construction, it's loans, it's larger deals that don't fall in our box, or it's a geography that we don't invest in our bat bucket of capital doesn't want to invest in directly. Not so much because it's a bad market, but just not where that group is, you know, where the family office that, that primarily backs us is focused. Um, we also tend to do a lot of advisory on our own deals. And what I mean by that is the last couple of deals that we closed, we brought in the joint venture equity, but we also sourced the debt. So we were sort of a full stack solution where um, we were able to bring a good debt deal to the table through some of our relationships. We're the ones that are ultimately living with it for you know three, five, 10 years or, or whatever. Um, but to give you a real time example, we're about to kick off an advisory assignment on a home building deal in Hawaii. We've done a lot of home building deals from an advisory standpoint. We know it really well. We know the capital really well. With our bucket of capital, it's not something they're going to invest in. Right. And that, that was actually a question that I was saying for later was talking about the conflict of interest between principal sure. side and then the advisory side. So, yeah, thanks for answering that. That, that definitely makes sense. And that's one way to yeah. clearly delineate that. So uh, for, for those that maybe are... Uh, unsure or unclear about, you know, the difference between a direct deal and, you know, like a JV, just explain how, you know, what those two things actually mean. And then also, how do you determine what a deal, what a good deal is for JV versus direct? And, and is there ways that each side of the business feed the other? Sure. So we really view, um, when, when I'm saying direct investment, I, I generally speaking, I mean a, a JV, um, where we're going in with a, a sponsor. I mean, we, we are primarily, we are an investment manager. So we're usually going in and directly investing with a sponsor on a real estate deal, as opposed to investing in say a fund or something like that. Um, we're usually looking for um, a, a sponsor where we're bringing in 90% of the equity or the, the majority equity check, they're bringing in 10% and we're forming a venture with them. And really what we're looking for is sponsors that we can do a lot of repeat business with. Got it. Perfect. That's the helpful clarification for sure. Yeah. Sorry about that. I know the direct with us doing something as a sponsor can be a little bit unclear. So now let's actually dive into sector specific. I know you guys are pretty, uh, you have the home building background, land development, things like that. And then you've diversified into the commercial space. So sure. what's, what's on the menu for today? Uh, what's the focus today? So on, our, our focus today is, is really unchanged from, from what it was say pre COVID. And that is we like multifamily value add multifamily and we like warehouse in, in competitive supply constrained markets. Um, generally speaking, what that means, despite the fact that we're um, based here in Newport Beach, we don't typically like California multi, um, mainly because of the political risk from a multi perspective. We like to go to markets that are benefiting from people leaving California or other high priced markets um, that have less potential political risk to them. Um, from a warehouse standpoint, we love the warehouse market here. We recently closed on a portfolio down in San Diego um, with a, a longtime landmark client that we had personally invested with before. We've got another one in escrow up in the South Bay area. And, and really what we're looking for there is, is markets with barriers to entry. And, and what that often means is we're not afraid of, of older product, um, smaller product, especially where, you know, you have low coverage or, or something like that, that differentiates it from the market and from what will be built new. So like the deal that we did in, uh, in in San Diego, for example, sourced off market sale lease back deal with an operator that runs a commercial landscaping business, highly um, COVID pandemic resistant, not going away, has been in business for years. Um, 
And one of the competitive advantages there is that those buildings on average in that portfolio are only like 23% FAR in a market where new build is 40 or above 40 FAR. So there's really a competitive advantage to that. It's hard to build today and users like to have, you know, large fenced yards where they can store trucks or equipment. Got it. Interesting. So you talked about California and then, the, you know, you're targeting generally Western markets. Are you seeing between the, the major markets of California and then the more secondary tertiary markets in California, are you seeing differences in, um, you know, demand, population, et cetera? Yeah, there, um, California is interesting um, because when you, when you read, you know, when you read news stories, it gets painted with a broad brush. Um, and the reality is that markets like San Francisco and, and LA are brutal right now, especially San Francisco. I mean, it, it, every day more news comes out. Part of it was because it was such a hot market leaving, leading up to this. It's highly supply constrained. Um, and, you know, with tech employees able to, to work remotely, it's kind of in the perfect storm. Um, but if you look further afield at a market like the Inland Empire, just inland from here, Riverside, San Bernardino, that market from both a home sales and a, a, um, and a multifamily perspective is one of the best performing markets in the United States. So the narrative is, OK, you know, everybody's leaving California and going to Arizona or Nevada and it's flooding those markets and rents are going up. And there's some, there's some truth to that, but they're also leaving the California cities and going more to the, the California suburbs. Now, where we, what, where, where we get more concerned about California is not those municipalities in like a Riverside or San Bernardino um, where people are moving or even up, you know, closer to Sacramento in the, in the Central Valley, it's more that something's going to be implemented on a statewide level. And we've already seen it implemented, um, not this election, but the last one, a rent control measure failed substantially at the ballot box. And then the uh, a super majority in the legislatures came in and implemented it, relatively toothless, but still, you know, rent caps nonetheless. And our concern is that there's just too much unpredictability here. Um, you know, I think looking at, at what happened this past election, Prop 21, which was would have um, uh, would have allowed cities to overturn Costa Hawkins and allowed cities to implement um, rent control and frankly vacancy control, however they see fit, failed epically. I don't think it won in a single uh, county, which is remarkable. Um, Prop 15 was a little bit closer, and we know we're going to see those both on the ballot or in, uh, you, you know, bills addressing them sometime in the next few years again. Yeah, good point. So now let's talk about value add versus core plus or, you know, sure. different strategies. So this is something that you and I have spoken about before and find yep. it to be very interesting uh, time right now with the way that, you know, value add and income is being priced. So talk about uh, your firm's flexibility or desire to, you know, pursue different return profile deals based on the relative attractiveness in the market. Yeah. So what, what, what I view or the way that we view this is we're not, we don't like passive deals as much. Um, we've had guys that have sent us deals that are, you know, a, credit tenant uh, CTL deal in the middle of some market in the Midwest where you look at the thing and it's leased to a, you know, a, a, a good credit um, with a 10 year lease, but then there's all trees around it. It's like, okay, well, what if that tenant leaves? And it may generate a, you know, low double digits return, which is great from a credit perspective, but we, we don't necessarily like that from a real estate perspective. We you know, view ourselves more as real estate investors and credit investors. So what we like to see is a, a specific business plan. We really focus hard on value add. And we like to see a specific business plan that's being executed that generates a, a commensurate return for the risk, regardless of what the market does. Um, we, we view value add as a very specific, narrow strategy 
where you're making improvements to a building, whether that be uh, physical improvements or man it could be management improvements. There are a lot of mismanagement stories. Um, creating a, a, uh, an additional return, a, a value enhancing return, and that that value enhancing return is, is um, substantial enough to make up for the construction risk or the re releasing risk, repositioning risk, regardless of what the market does. Um, so, you know, we get a lot of sponsor books or broker books that include, um, you know, a pretty aggressive uh, trending of rents. And when you peel back the onion a little bit and say, okay, well, what happens if rents don't go up? And we're other than the other than uh, bumping to market once the the renovations done or the repositioning's done, and we find that oftentimes the returns really aren't that good, but they look good because there's trending, because there's aggressive leverage, or you know, in in some other cases we'll just see something that you know is maybe bought in the mid fours, very light, um, if if any rehab, but financing's really aggressive, and there's a you know interest only uh, uh, debt that's at pretty high leverage that allows for a double digits cash on cash, but it really doesn't say much to us about the quality of the deal. So the, the metrics, you know, what we really like to focus on is we are laser focused on, um, uh, on stabilized yield on cost, ideally stabilized untrended yield on cost. I know you and I have talked about, it. I think you did a really good video on LinkedIn about it that I saw a few weeks back. Um, the reason why is that is a primary metric to us. In the rents are easy to check, the expense ratio is fairly easy to check, and the development costs are fairly easy to check. You know, if you you know that if you're going in doing cosmetic rehab and and redoing uh, bathrooms and putting in plank flooring and doing quartz countertops, it, that in every market there's you know, boxes that checks. And if you're re-roofing and tearing it down to the studs and doing plumbing that, you know, that's going to come in at a different cost. And it's, I mean, they're, they're verifiable um, uh, assumptions that go into that model. So what we find is that an over-focus on levered IRR, um, while it may be your waterfall metric, it's really what we view as a secondary metric because there are other things, especially with getting it on the, the financing side that can really fudge that metric and make a, a not so great deal look like a great deal simply through the use of, of imprudent, we would argue, leverage. So when we look at something, you know, the first thing we're looking at is, okay, do these operating expenses make sense? Um, does the, do the, the rent, does the rental income make sense at stabilization? Um, are they, you know, underwriting to a ridiculous, um, uh, expense ratio, or is it a reasonable one? And then where is it stabilizing? And in our view, a uh, hundred basis points over market cap rate at stabilization is a, is a pretty good place to start. And we know that if we see a deal that underwrites to that, it's going to be a pretty good deal if it's structured correctly and probably deliver for a mid-teens return on a reasonable hold period. But what we'll often see is somebody will send a deal and it's, you know, 27 IRR, but it, 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 when you dig into it, it's not that great a deal. Yeah, I love that stable stabilized yield on cost metric. And the one thing that I believe I pointed out before that it's only downfall is that it doesn't factor in time, you know, the time it takes. If you've got a huge development time yeah. to get to where you need to be, that can drag returns or at least have a big difference. So I see a lot of people are aggressive in their stabilization assumptions and thinking, well, I'll maintain 95% occupancy while I'm renovating, you know, five yeah. units a week or whatever it is. And that's just not not possible. So that's that's another key piece that uh, you know to have to you have to get right in your underwriting. Terrific point. And and we underwrite everything in our own models here. You know, we're not we look at the sponsor model. It's a great way to to assess the sophistication of a sponsor. That okay, when they're rolling a unit on an on an incremental roll, not something where you're vacating the building. How long are they showing that unit vacated for? You know, are they only showing a month? But they're putting twenty thousand into a unit that probably doesn't work, you know, because you've got to vacate the unit. You've got two to three weeks, and then you're leasing it up. It's a really aggressive assumption. And you know, are they trying to make what, like you said, are they trying to over maintain their cash flow while they're renovating and repositioning? Totally agree. Right, and that could be a double whammy when 
compared to the actuals, because what you're going to see in actuality is you're going to see higher vacancy than you projected and a yep. longer stabilization time than you projected. Absolutely. So you mentioned uh, earlier that you guys like to do 90 tens, and then you also brought up the word waterfall. So I wanted to jump into walking through a typical JV structure. You know, what, what are some of the bells sure. and whistles that you guys like to have? So um, it, it, it really does depend on the deal. Um, and I know that's kind of a, a cheap answer, but I'll give you the, you know, roughly the way that, that we look at things is um, we're usually 90 10. We want to make sure that our sponsors do have some skin in the game after the, the act fee. Um, we're fine with paying fees. We, we understand we're paying for performance. We, the last thing we want is a sponsor that um, is, is fee starved and distracted trying to generate overhead uh, elsewhere. We think that's a horrible idea. And it's something that we've pointed out to sponsors before on small deals, which is, hey, um, you know, you guys are deferring an act fee or something. How are you generating enough income to keep the lights on before you get into your promote on this, before we, we have a capital event. Um, so we, we look at that. Um, we're usually, uh, you know, our prefs vary pretty widely. Like I'll tell you on something like that sale leaseback deal that I mentioned before, you know, we're at a pref that I think it's a six pref on that where something with a more substantial value add component, we may be at a, you know, at an eight. Um, and then we're usually a two to three step waterfall um, that, uh, you know, the, the, the higher tier, depending on the, the duration of the investment. And we're usually kind of a three year hold type of, of platform, maybe a five, you know, is somewhere in the call it mid to high teens on the final hurdle. Got it. Right. I have a quick, funny story. I was on sure. the phone with a fund and I was just walking through their structure and they're saying, well, we don't pay any acquisition fee. And then my phone dropped the call. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just dropped the conference call. And so then I dialed back in and they said, wow, well, we thought you just hung up on us because we don't pay an acquisition fee. And uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was a funny one, but. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we pay, we're, we are fine with paying market fees and we want to make sure that, you know, that the GNA is covered because, I mean, having a distracted sponsor who's out trying to work on a consulting project or something to keep the lights on when he should be trying to execute on the deal just seems like a bad idea. Right. So moving to the uh, asset management side. Sure. Like you guys have a deep expertise in that, you know, with that yes. background prior to Ranch Harbor. So how do you avoid or how, how does that relationship work with the sponsor and, and yourselves and, you know, avoiding too many cooks in the kitchen? Yeah, it, it varies by sponsor. So some of the sponsors that we work with, um, and I'll give you again, the example of uh, our sponsor in San Diego that we closed with recently has a large organization. They've bought, I think 150 deals in Southern California and, and some in Texas over the past like 10 years. They run an institutional caliber shop. They have institutional LPs on their larger deals. Um, they run sophisticated software. They are incredibly good and incredibly detailed. Um, when we have a sponsor like that, we let them run typically the, the primary asset management. They give us reports and then we um, feed that into our software, our back office software we use Sage um, so that we're producing a consistent work product uh, for, for our investors when they, you know, when they're getting their quarterly or monthly reports depending on the deal from us. Um, in other cases, and that's one of the things that we look at with sponsors is, you know, is this a one-man band? Is it somebody with a, with a deep bench? Um, with somebody that is a more of a one-man band or a newer sponsor, or maybe hasn't made the big investment um, in their back office software, you know, we'll look at that and say, okay, we like this deal. We like you. We think we can grow with you. But in order to do that, we need to take over the asset management on this. We don't want to be getting something in Excel or QuickBooks or whatever. You know, we're, we're used to reporting to a, a multi-billion dollar PE fund. Um, and we're able to kind of institutionalize that partner, put them on our reporting platform. We have a, a fee for, you know, for doing that. 
or we'll take it on where we're in a, in a co-GP position to kind of help them grow their business as well. We're, we're open to doing that. We have extremely flexible capital, but that's really how we avoid the too many cooks in the kitchen is um, the, the who's doing what is laid out up front in the joint venture agreement, really typically in the LOI where we're taking a deep look. And you know, most of the sponsors that we're working with are, um, are investor developers or investors that that we've known for a while or that we've gotten to know through a broker through you know direct relationships or whatever so we really know what their capabilities are up front and we know what their people can do and we know what their systems are we've already kind of seen the work product yeah I, i'm glad that you took uh, that answer into into the operator direction because I, when you started describing the, the san diego operator my mind was thinking oh gosh there's definitely some listeners that are sponsors and they're thinking, oh, wow, well, I'm yeah. not institutional like that. I'm never going to get funded. And, sure. you know, that, in my opinion, that's not the case. And um, I'm sure you agree. No, it's it's not at all. And, um, you know, obviously, when we can do deals with sponsors like that and they're targeting kind of the below the rum line deals, it's great. Um, but a lot of them aren't. And, and we understand that the business that we're in, that, you know, a lot of the sponsors that we're going to see are um, uh, operators that came out of a big shop and have a, a hyper focused, great business plan on, you know, one or two markets where they know all the brokers. Um, they're very ingrained. They know everything that's going on in that market. and They're going to see good deals, but they maybe don't have the back office. And that's where we've you know, view a lot of our value add on this is they can grow on our platform with us as opposed to a, you know, a bigger um, institutional fund manager that may look at and go, well, you know, you're too small, the deal's too small, you don't have the, the reporting requirements that we want to see, so it's a pass, and then they end up, you know, passing the hat, and they've got to spend a bunch of time on syndications, so yeah, absolutely does not, you know, rule out doing deals with smaller sponsors. So what are some ways sponsors that fit kind of that profile that we just discussed, what are some of the things that they can do, you know, starting now to yeah. build up their themselves, their business, to be in a better, to be in the best position to, you know, partner with a, a shop like yours and, and, and raise more sophisticated capital? Sure. So I, I think first and foremost is have a, be an expert at something, right? Um, where, where we get a little bit sideways with smaller shops and have a difficult time doing deals, even if we're impressed with the sponsor, is when it's a one or two person shop with a lot of things outsourced, but they've got deals all over the country at, that are supposedly value add. And we're saying, okay, well, if you've got a deal in Chicago and you know, you've got a deal in Phoenix and you've got a deal in Seattle, how are you really managing that as a, you know, as a one or two person shop? We would rather see the, um, the operator that goes really deep in Albuquerque or Phoenix or whatever has a great thesis there and is tied into that market and is tied into that market to the point that when a deal comes available, that they're able to, you know, to pounce on it because they know the brokers or they've done a lot of outreach to sellers. Um, so I, I think that's really the, you know, the first thing is, is the relationships, the, mar the, the uh, focus on a niche in a given market, um, and, and really understanding that being small can be a big disadvantage if you're trying to play on big deals and you know, bid on, on big broker packages and then bring in a ton of capital. Or it can be an advantage because you can fly below the radar of, of, of all those deals that get bid up and not have to go place, you know, 20 million of equity in a 200 unit deal in, in a prime market. Right, definitely. So you mentioned before, you know, getting to know operators and brokers and whatnot. So we wanted to learn more about your your sourcing process for deal flow and, and, and meeting operators. What are some of the ways that you guys do that? Sure. So a lot of um, a lot of the time we're seeing um, deals that, that come in directly. And that's partially because of our history with Landmark. 
um, and just and and Isles Ranch and and people that you know that we know in the industry that that we've worked with for years. Um, we also have um, you know some some very good capital brokers that we know that you know will say, hey, this is a group you ought to keep an eye on. I, we know them. We'll make an intro, and they're groups that we don't know, and it's it's kind of been a get to know you process that we're in the middle of now, um, really seeing how they work. They can see how we work. Where I would say we're not as good is more on a big trans on a, a transactional basis, um, where it's hey, here's a deal um, with a sponsor we don't know, and a mar even if it's in a market we don't know. And what we what we really like to avoid um, from a, a, a capital efficiency standpoint and a not enough time in the day standpoint is getting into real competitive bid capital situations where you've got a broker who is damn good at their job that you know has a deal that's attractive and it's going to generate ten term sheets from interested capital and you just kind of bang your head against the wall steadily lowering the returns. We'd rather go in early, have very clear pricing expectations, make a fair deal, you know, see something at or before LOI with a sponsor we already know and, and we're comfortable with. So we're, you know, we, we don't have a, the nature of our capital, it's not must place. Uh, we, we don't have to rush that out the door to, to scale up. So we'd rather uh, spend a little bit more time in the in the courtship period, I guess, than a lot of others. Good stuff. Well, Adam, I greatly appreciate your time. Please let listeners know the best way to learn more about Ranch Harbor and, and reach out if, if there's event, if there's interest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we um, ranchharbor.com is uh, is our website. Um, it's, it's a great way to reach us. You can learn more about it. Uh, we just launched that a few months ago. Um, in addition, I have a, a daily, uh, blog that, that I post called, uh, called basis points, basispointsblog.com that, uh, has some original content that I'll write as well as, uh, as curation of, you know, real estate and economic news that, uh, that we put on there. Um, and then if you're interested in learning more, you know, reach out directly um we're you know we we return calls we're good on quick nose and and i think we you know try and get uh, get good feedback to to engage with uh with potential sponsors or for that matter potential investors in, in relatively short order good stuff well thanks again for your time thanks rob appreciate it